Here's what's going on this week at ALCF. Make plans to attend the Fall Women's Bible Study, where Beth Anderson, Tiffany Miller, Megan Easterhouse, and Corey Luritz will introduce you to the fruit of the Spirit, nine key attributes of people living lives aligned with the Holy Spirit as described in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The event takes place on Wednesdays starting September 25th through November 13th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Want to learn how to get connected in ministry here at ALCF? Anxious to be developed as a leader? Then our monthly leadership community gatherings are for you. These are rich times to hear vision, meet other leaders, and get the tools needed to grow in your gifts and leadership. Whether you're a covenant partner or are thinking about joining our church, we welcome you to our next leadership community gathering on Saturday, September 21st from 1030 a.m. to 12 noon in the chapel. Get ready for a great afternoon of fellowship, fun, food, and games at the annual ALCF Picnic. This event takes place on Sunday, September 22nd from 12 to 4 p.m. at Rankstorf Park in Mountain View. Please sign up to bring a dish and to help us out at alcf.net slash signups. ALCF is proud to host the first Bay Area Disability Ministry Conference where new parents, churches considering disability ministries, and established disability ministries can come together to learn, connect, and collaborate. Diane Kim, the keynote speaker, is a special needs ministry consultant, national speaker, and author of Unbroken Faith, Spiritual Recovery for the Special Needs Parent. This event takes place on Saturday, September 28th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the sanctuary, and you can register today at disabilityministryconference.com. To sign up for any of these upcoming events, go to alcf.net slash signups or check out the ALCF app. And remember, abundant life exists to make a better you for a better world. So quiet. The year was 1963 and a well-known figure, polarizing figure, controversial in part because of his religious beliefs, stood up in front of a crowd to recite a poem. He was one of the great American poets of the 20th century. His name at the time was Cassius Clay. Some of you will know him better as Muhammad Ali. And the poem he recited in front of that crowd was titled, I Am the greatest. When he introduced the poem, this is what he said. He said, I am the greatest by Cassius Clay. This is the legend of Cassius Clay, the most beautiful fighter in the world today. I want to read just a few lines of that poem. We don't have time to read the whole thing. But hear what he told that audience that day. He said, this brash young boxer is something to see. And the heavyweight championship is his destiny. This kid fights great. He's got speed and endurance. But if you sign to fight him, increase your insurance. (laughs) For I am the man this poem is about, the next champ of the world, there isn't a doubt. If Cassius says a cow can lay an egg, don't ask how. Grease that skillet. When I say two, there's never a third. Betting against me is completely absurd. When Cassius says a mouse can outrun a horse, don't ask how. Put your money where your mouse is. I am the greatest. Interestingly, about 2,000 years prior, another controversial figure, also known for his religious views, got up in front of a crowd, and though he didn't recite a poem per se, The opening lines of Jesus Christ's Sermon on the Mount have a poetic feel to them. And though he could have said, I am the greatest, and he's the only one in history who could have said that, he didn't. He didn't even say, blessed are the greatest. He said, blessed are the meek. Now that messes with us a little bit, doesn't it? That messes with us because we live in a culture, we live in a world that from the time we are really literal ingrains into our head the exact opposite. We learn very early on that the meek are the ones who are overlooked, left behind, and forgotten. The meek get picked last for kickball. The meek don't become prom queen. The meek get cut from the football team, they don't get into the college they want, and they certainly don't get the best jobs. 
So when Cassius Clay said, I am the greatest, what he really was saying was the, the controlling beatitude of America. He was saying, blessed are the greatest. Blessed are those who see what they want and go out and get it. Blessed are the aggressive. Blessed are the ones who tell everyone else how great they are. Blessed are the winners. Blessed are the greatest. And this is a word for us in the Bay Area. You all know that I've lived a bunch of different places, and you've heard me say this before. The Bay Area is like America on steroids. All of America's good things and bad things, its sins, its issues, its values, are just ramped up in this crazy place. The wealth, the poverty, the contrast between the two, the congestion and the traffic and the housing issues, the weather. If you take the best weather from the Midwest, the East, and the South, pump it full of HGH and anabolic roids, you get Mountain Views weather 365 days a year. What, you, what, what we think is normal here is not normal anywhere else. I saw, I saw a house the other day in South San Jose, three beds, two baths, not updated, 850K. And I'm like, wow, that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> that, nowhere in the, I mean, maybe Manhattan, right? Maybe Manhattan, you, you, you see through those lenses. And what we see as normal here is not normal. Did you all see um, our friend Steph and Aisha just bought a new house? $31 million in Atherton. You know, I grew up in Ohio. You know what $31 million gets you in Ohio? <laughs> Cleveland. It gets you Cleveland. <laughs> Steph and Aisha got an acre here. They could have had Cleveland. And based on their performance last week, I bet they'd throw in the Browns. <laughs> so we live in this place and we live in this culture that just pounds into our heads. Blessed are the winners. And we're just, trying to, we're just trying to do life here. We're just trying to make it, just, just trying to make ends meet. And here comes Jesus, and as he so often does, he pulls the pin out of a hand grenade, proverbially, lobs it into our preconceived notions, and blows them to smithereens. He comes in and he says, no, 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 no. Not blessed are the greatest. Blessed are the meek. And like my first question is, what does that even mean? So I'm glad you asked. We're going to unpack it this morning. We're going to look at this verse and we're going to try and answer three things. The first is this, what is meekness? The second question we're going to try and answer is, why be meek? And then the third question we're going to try and answer is, how can we be meek? What is meekness? Why be meek? And how can we be meek? But before we dive into the text, I just want us to get a sense for the context of this passage in the greater biblical narrative. So we know we're in the Sermon on the Mount. And the setting for the Sermon on the Mount is this. Jesus, at the beginning of his public ministry, heads up on a mountain to give the law, God's requirements, to a bunch of people who are listening. Some of you will remember that 1,500 years prior, a man named Moses met God where? On a mountain to give the law to a bunch of people. And the balance of the Old Testament... That happened in Exodus. Right there. The rest of the Old Testament is basically the story of how impossible it was for those people to live up to the law that God gave them on Mount Sinai. So we get to the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus heads up on a mountain, and he starts talking about the law. And here's what we hope he's, here's what I wish he had said. I wish Jesus had gotten up on that mountain and he said, hey guys, that Old Testament law, that was a real humdinger, wasn't it? But great try. Really good effort. We know now that you can't live up to it. So the Father and the Spirit and I have talked about it. We're going to go ahead and just lower the standards. We're going to make the law a little bit easier so that some more of you might be able to live up to it. Wouldn't that have been nice? What does he do? The opposite. He says the refrain for the Sermon on the Mount, as we're going to see over the coming weeks and months, is this. You have heard it said, but I say to you. And so Jesus says things like this. He says, you've heard it said that if you murder somebody, you've broken the law. But I say to you, if you have ever been angry with someone, you've committed murder in your heart and you've broken the law. He says, you've heard it said 
If you commit adultery, you've broken the law. But I say to you, if you ever looked at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart and you have broken the law. So instead of lowering the standard of this law that was impossible to live up to, Jesus comes along and he says, you've been playing on a 10-foot hoop? We're putting it at 50. So the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is the same purpose as the Old Testament law. It is to show us how desperately we need a Savior, how impossible it is for us to live up to God's standards on our own, and both of them drive us to Christ because he is the only one who can fulfill the law, and he does it, and he does it in our place. Now, we're in, we're in the Beatitudes this morning. Those are the blessings that start out this Sermon on the Mount, and I want us to see why those come at the beginning. Jesus is telling us by starting this sermon off with blessings, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. He is saying this is a law of grace. He is saying you get the blessings before you do any of the requirements. The Old Testament law started the same way. Do you remember the Ten Commandments? How do they start? It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. I already saved you. Now here's what I expect. It's not, here's what I expect, then I will save you. The Sermon on the Mount and the text we're looking at today are communicating the exact same thing. Jesus is not saying, live up to all the standards of the law and then you might get the blessings. He's saying the blessings are yours. And in response, here's how I want you to live. And he comes along and he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, we're just like, what does that even mean? So let's try and figure it out. First question we're going to look at, what is meekness? What is meekness? So when we look at the first half of this verse, there are four words. Blessed are the meek. We good with are? We good with the? All right, let's talk about blessed for two seconds. Brian's already covered it in past sermons for those who haven't been here. This idea of blessed carries the idea of happy, fortunate, or privileged. But as one commentator I read this week said, it's not a state of mind. It's not saying that you feel happy in your head. It's a state of life. So Jesus is saying blessed is the life. Happy is the life. Privileged is the life of someone who is meek. And so what does that word meek mean? Our, our current culture has kind of hijacked it. And we have a really kind of negative understanding of what the word meek means, but that's not really what it meant back in the original Greek, back when Jesus was using that word. So in other English translations of this verse, you'll see that word translated humble or gentle, and those are really good synonyms. So this idea of meek, it, I, I'm not going to go there. I thought about it. First Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love is gentle, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. That's actually a really good description of meekness. Now meekness is not love, but they share a lot of the same characteristics. In classical Greek, this word meek was used to describe a tame animal, soothing medicine, a mild word, or a gentle breeze. The meek person is gentle, kind, patient, not easily offended. The Hebrew parallel word literally means to be bowed over or to be bent over. So what is meekness not? You've heard this before, I, I assume, Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not low self-esteem or low self-confidence or insecurity or introvertedness. Spoiler alert, Jesus calls himself meek. And we're going to talk about that. This is the Jesus who told Peter to his face, you are Satan. This is the Jesus who made it, took a homemade whip and went through the temple flipping over the tables of the money changers. This is the Jesus who told the Pharisees to their faces, you are like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you are death and you are children of the devil. That same Jesus called himself meek. So meekness is not weakness. And I think we get a sense for what this word means when we look at where he puts it in the context of the blessings. We're on the third blessing. Look at the first two with me. The first one is blessed are the poor in spirit. And as Brian talked about a few weeks ago, this carries the idea of people who understand they can do nothing on their own and they are totally dependent on God. The second beatitude is blessed are those who mourn. And those people who have experienced hard things. They may be mourning over the fact that they can't do anything on their own or they may be mourning over the fact that they've been through some really hard things. 
But I think those two characteristics help us understand what the meek person looks like. Because someone who recognizes they can't do it on their own and has also experienced sadness and mourning is the person who is not too full of themselves, who, who, who approaches life with a gentleness and a kindness and a meekness that someone who thinks they can do it all themselves and has never been through anything hard simply does not have. There's a pastor named Eugene Peterson. He's not with us anymore, pastor and a scholar. Uh, amazing, amazing scholar. He translated the Bible into kind of colloquial English, and it's called The Message. And I love the way Eugene Peterson translated this verse in The Message. He translated the first half of the verse as saying this. In his mind, he called meekness this. He says, you're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. The idea of meekness gets at somebody who knows exactly who they are and is good with it. Way easier said than done. It's a little bit like this. I can come into this church, I can sit down there in the chairs, or I can stand up here on the stage, and in front of you and in front of God, I can say, I am a miserable sinner, and I'm a jerk. And, and, and I know it because I live it. I see it every day. But if this service were to end and I step down off these stairs and you meet me at the front or you meet me out in the lobby and the first thing out of your mouth is you are a miserable sinner and a jerk. That's a different story, right? It's cool for me to say it, but if you're coming at me saying it, now, now my first response is something like, do we need to take this outside, my friend? I'll see you behind the dumpster. No teachers, 1230. <laughs> Depending on who you are. If it's like Elder Glenn or Tavita, I'm going to be like, good, yeah, cool. But if you're a normal-sized person, my first thing is going to want to be like to defend myself, right? Everything in me when you say that wants to defend and deflect and justify. Everything in me wants to say, I am the greatest. But Jesus is saying, that's not how my disciples live. That's not how the meek person responds. The meek person knows exactly who they are and is good with it. The other thing I want us to see before we finish up this point is that Jesus is not implying that you're blessed if life has forced you to be meek. If you just got to, if, if, you know, some of us in here have just had a crummy run of life and just it hasn't gone the way that we'd hoped and we're not where we would like to be. There are people all over this community and world who just, they don't have what other people have. And, and Jesus is, is not saying if, if life just has been rough for you and you've been forced to be humble, then, then you can be blessed. That's true. That's totally true. But this is not a passive thing. This is an active thing. Jesus is saying whether anyone can choose to be meek, whether you're the last prisoner on death row at the state penitentiary or whether you are the president of the United States, we'll come back to that one, <laughs> or anywhere in between, you can be meek. And so again, this is a hard word for us here in Steroidsville, USA. Because everything in us wants to go along with the current of the culture. Everything in us just thinks, man, if, if I could just show my classmates how smart I am, then I'll be blessed. If I, if I could just show the coaches how hard I worked in the off season, I'll be blessed. If, if all the other moms just knew how beautiful and well-behaved my children are and how amazing our vacation in Tahoe was, then I'll be blessed. If management could just see how important I am and how much value I add to this company, then I'll be blessed. If I just had a few more followers and a few more likes and had some influence, then I'll be blessed. And so for a lot of us, whether it's conscious or unconscious, our lives are one big self-promotion tour just trying to make sure people know how good we are and how smart we are, how talented and gifted we are. And Jesus is coming along in this verse and he is saying, that is not how I am calling you to live. You don't need to promote yourself because my disciples know exactly who they are and they are good with it. What is meekness? It is humility. It is gentleness. It is a kind word. It's patience. It is, it is understanding who we are in light of God's word and being good with it. Good? Let's go, to, let's go to the second question. Second question then is this, why be meek? 
So, so far we've looked only at the first half of the verse. Now let's look at the second half of the verse. Second half of the verse says this. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Again, like what does that, what does that really mean? It's interesting to note the word in Greek that is translated earth in this verse, many other places in the New Testament is translated land. It can mean both. So if I reread that verse, but I say land instead of earth, some of you who are familiar with your Old Testament are going to have a light bulb go off. If you're not familiar with your Old Testament, that's great. Hang with us for a while, and you're going to get more familiar with it. But if I say, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land, what does that make you think of? One of the great promises of the Old Testament of God to Abraham and the nation of Israel, God in his covenant with Abraham in Genesis says to him, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the world through your descendants and I'm going to give you a land. And that became the promised land. And so what, what Jesus is actually doing in this verse, he is directly quoting from the Psalms. So look at Psalm 37 with me, starting in verse 10. Psalm 37, verse 10, this is written by David. It says this, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. So I think the context for this psalm is in Jesus' mind as he tells his New Testament listeners, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. The context is this, David, King David and the Israelites are in the promised land, but they have not fully conquered it yet. It hasn't gone the way that God, wanted, God told them it would go because they haven't held up their end of the bargain. But look at what God is telling the Israelites through David in that psalm. He's saying, not the powerful, not the aggressive are going to finish the conquest of the land. He's saying the meek. He's saying, I laugh at the wicked because I know their day is coming to an end because the battle is mine. It's not yours. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. And so that's certainly in Jesus' listeners' minds as he talks about this. This great promise of the Old Testament is now being transferred to me, a disciple of Jesus. And I love what Jesus does here. Because we are familiar, we've talked about it already, with how Jesus elevates the requirements of the law in the Sermon on the Mount. But what he's doing in this moment is he's not just elevating the requirements, he's elevating the blessings. Do you see it? He's not talking any longer about a piece of land on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. He's talking about the whole earth. And don't take my word for it. Take the Apostle Paul. No, no, no. Take John's. Sorry, wrong text. Take, take John's. In Revelation chapter 5, John sees God in heaven. He sees the 24 elders around the throne. They fall down and this is what they say. Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10. They sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So, so what does the, the meek will inherit the earth mean? It means literally what it is saying. We have a promise for those of us who are in Christ that we are going to literally reign on the earth in eternity. This is an eschatological, that's just a fancy word for end times promise, where Jesus is saying, you can be meek now because you have a big set of goods coming to you in the full, fullness of time. So, so why be meek? Because God's fighting our battles for us. It's not up to us. And we're going to get the goods. For those in Christ, the goods are coming to us in just a little while. Uh, I, was, I was very young, four, maybe five at the most, but I remember it super, super clearly. Um, I, had a, I have a sister who's two years younger than me. I have a brother who's five and a half. He wasn't even around yet. So it was me, my sister, and my mom. Super hot summer day. Uh, and my mom, bless her heart, opened up the freezer and brought out the box of popsicles and, and took us out to the deck. And now this wasn't a new box. We'd been working on it for whatever, a few days, a week or whatever. So there, it wasn't the, full, wasn't the fullness of popsicles in there. There were just a few left. As she pulled them out of the box to start to divvy them up, I recognized pretty quickly that there was only one red popsicle left. 
And so I did what any young disciple would do. I rose up and took a hold of my destiny. And apparently my mother did not share the same view of my destiny that I did because she promptly took that red popsicle away from me to teach me a lesson about selfishness and gave it to my meek sister. And I got the yellow one. And who wants the yellow one? Nobody. A, a banana popsicle should not exist. We all know, we all know that to be true. What, what, what does this silly story about a, a selfish four-year-old have to do with us? Well, it's how a lot of us are going through life. A lot of us are going through life saying, I see that red popsicle. I want that red popsicle. I'm going to rise up and take that red popsicle. And it makes it really hard to live with meekness when we are trying to get what we want. Why, why, are, we, why are we gossiping and criticizing at work and always angling? Because we see that red popsicle of the promotion. We want that red popsicle of the promotion. And we're going to go ahead and get that red popsicle of the promotion. Why are we, why are we short-tempered and unkind to our spouse or our significant other? Because we see the red popsicle of what the perfect spouse should look like, and we're going to do everything we can to rise up and take hold of it. And I know, look, I know there's more going on here, but I can speak from my own, my own personal life. Why am I harsh and unkind and overbearing with my children? Why am I not meek with them? Because I see that red popsicle of what perfect, obedient um, children that look good to everybody else on the outside looks like, and I'm like, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to take hold of the red popsicle and it, meekness is not going to get it for me, so I'm just going to do it the way I think it needs to be done. And, and, what, and what God is saying in this, you, you're going to inherit the earth. You don't have to rise up and take what you think that you want now. And especially, you don't have to do it out of unmeekness. I don't know if that's a word, but we're going we're to go with it. We're going to go with it for this sermon. So, so why be meek? Because the meek will inherit the earth. And then finally, as we, as we head to our, our third point, and there's a lot of overlap here, but I just know that any good preacher has three points, and I'm not saying I'm a good preacher, but I have three points. <laughs> the last one, the last question we're going to try and answer is how can we be meek? Uh, if, if those who are the, the astute among you who have been paying close attention to the nine or ten words in this verse are like there's one word that we haven't really talked about. Inherit. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the meek, for they will get the earth as a gift. He doesn't say, blessed are the meek, for they will get the earth as a reward. He says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. See, if it was a gift, there's not a lot of certainty surrounding that. You, you can tell someone you're going to give them a gift and then never actually follow through on it. And likewise, we spent a lot of time already talking about how the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is that the blessings are not a reward. We don't earn the inherit, we don't earn the earth by our meekness. Jesus says that the meek will inherit the earth because there is a legal obligation associated with an inheritance. What, is it, what does inherit make you think of? An heir. An inheritance goes to an heir. And what Jesus is communicating in this verse is that when we are in Christ, we are not just going to get a gift. We are not just going to get a reward. We are co-heirs with Christ. And the king is our father. And the inheritance is waiting for us. And so we can be meek because we know we don't have a gift. We don't have a reward coming. But we have an inheritance. Look at what the apostle Paul says. This is the apostle Paul. Romans 8. 16 to 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We can be meek in this life because we know we have an inheritance coming. We do not have to rise up and take what we think we want or what we think is ours now because the king is our father and his full inheritance is coming to us. Now, I know some of you are thinking, uh, how is this guy going to preach a sermon on gentleness or humility and not talk about the Donald? Now is your time. And I know I'm stepping out on really thin ice. 
So I'm going to qualify this up, down, left, and right. But if you want a picture of what does meekness not look like, I, don't, I don't, personally don't do this, but you could just hang out in his Twitter feed and just that is a picture of what meekness is not. Now, I'm not, I, I'm not making a political statement here, but just follow where I'm about to, follow where I'm going. H- hang with me for a second. I am not saying this is true. I've read it a couple places. It is a rumor, a rumor, a rumor. I have no inside information. But I have read several places that initially, President Trump did not really want to become president. It was just kind of a pu- publicity thing to build his brand for like his TV show and for his uh, hotels and golf courses and stuff. And somewhere along the way, things like pride and competitiveness and winning and blessed are the greatness came in and lo and behold, he won the presidency. Now, I'm not saying it's true. It's a rumor, but, but based on how the last few years has gone, I don't think it's that far out of the question to think that maybe there's a possibility that was the case. If it was, is it not possible that by winning the presidency, he actually lost? From just a purely quality of life, emotional and mental health, relationships, and for just like a bunch of people in his administration and, and in this country who have, who have suffered over these last few years, is it possible that by winning, he lost? Now, what does that have to do with us? A lot of us are in danger of doing the same thing. A lot of us are in danger of just going with the flow of our culture and whether we recognize it or not, adopting the values of, man, there's just something out there that I'm, I'm sure if I can get it, that will give me the blessed life, the happy life, the privileged, the favored life. Some of, you, some of us may not even know what that actually is, but we just know we need to compete and we need to strive and we need to win. But the message of this verse, blessed is the meek, is that for those who are in Christ, you are free of that. We are free of that. We do not have to win at all costs. We do not have to set something out there and say, if I just had that, then I would have the blessed life and strive, strive, strive. Because when you get it, you may realize it didn't deliver what you thought it was going to anyway. So what I'm not saying I'm not saying don't have goals, don't have aspirations, don't have a vision for your life and plans for it, but I'm saying have those in the context of your relationship with Christ and your heirship as his son or as his daughter. We can be meek because we know that our father is the king and we have an inheritance coming and we don't have to do it the way the world does it. Always striving, always competing, always trying to win. Because Jesus is coming to us and saying, I'm going to give you what you want. It might even be something you don't even know that you want, and I'm going to give it to you. So we can be meek, because the battle is God's. It is not ours. Now, Jesus didn't just teach this. He lived it. Jesus, Jesus, said, Jesus said, and we're going to look at it in a minute, Jesus said that one of the characteristics of his nature was that he was meek. This is the Jesus who, when beaten, spat upon, and mocked, didn't fight back, didn't retaliate, didn't pop anyone in the nose. This is the Jesus who told Peter, put your sword away. This is the Jesus who, though falsely accused in front of Pilate, stood silent, though he was completely innocent. This is the Jesus who voluntarily went to the cross and died for sins he did not commit, for the sins that you and I committed. And while he was up on that cross, though he could have called a legion of angels to come and wipe out his murderers, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. This word meek is used only four times in the entire New Testament. Three of them are in Matthew. One of them is in a passage that will be very familiar to many of us. It's in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. It says this, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That word gentle, same word word that is translated meek in our text today. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As the worship team comes. In biblical times, it was an agrarian society, and the way that they would train a new young ox is they would yoke it to an older, more experienced ox. So they would go side by side, same yoke across their back, and the older, more experienced ox would teach the younger, less experienced ox the pace, how fast or how slow to walk, when to turn left, when to turn right. He would teach him how to hear and obey the voice of the master. Jesus Christ is saying to all of us, I am meek. And I want you to be meek. But I'm not just going to let you hang out there on your own and try and figure it out. He is saying, yoke yourself to me. And I will show you what it looks like to be meek. Not only will I show you, I will empower you to live a life of calmness, patience, humility, and gentleness that you could never live apart from me. Jesus Christ is saying, yoke yourself to me. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. So whether you've been walking with Christ for 50 years or whether you don't even know who he is and you're just checking this Christianity thing out, my plea with you today, not my, I'm not going to urge you, my plea with you today is to yoke yourself to Christ. Learn from him how to do life. Receive his power inside of you through his spirit. How to live the life that he calls you to live. For his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The only thing you have to gain is the entire earth. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you don't only call us to do things, but you model for us exactly how it's to be done. And, and, and you don't only model it, you empower us to do it. And so God, as we're trying to do life in this, this area of the country, this area of the world that just spits on the idea of meekness, I pray, God, that you would empower us to live lives of gentleness and humility, kindness and patience. I pray, God, that you would help us to know in light of who you are and what you have done, who we are, and to be totally content with it. We ask all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.